Uh, my name is Craig Small. I'm a medical marijuana business attorney here in Colorado. I've been practicing since uh, 2009. I'm on the board of directors for Colorado Normal. I'm a member of the National Normal. And I'm on the Amendment 64 task force representing the consumers. All right. Thank you for coming tonight. You're welcome. We also have Warren Edson. We all know Warren Edson, graduated from our own DU. One of the organizers of Colorado's Amendment 20. He recently ran for Denver's District 8 City Council, and he specializes in medical marijuana law. Warren and his wife Georgia own Marijuana Radio, iCannabis Radio. Thank you for being here tonight, Warren. We have Robert Corey, it's a Colorado-based attorney and litigator, admitted to practice law in Colorado, Colorado, California, and the District of Columbia. A Stanford Law graduate, he specializes in marijuana law and has tried and won more medical marijuana jury trials than any other attorney, well, every attorney in Colorado combined. So thanks for coming tonight, Rob. Then we have Mike Elliott. We also, we know Mike Elliott is the director of the Medical Marijuana Industry Group. Since January of 2011, um, we just saw him on our DUID panel. And you're also, what, what task force or what campaign are you working on? Um, I'm on the, uh, it's the Taxes, Funding, and Civil Law Working Group, which is one of the five working groups of the Amendment 64 task force. Okay, thank you so much for being here. That's the hard one, right? That has to hurt your brain a little bit. <laughs> yes, my brain has been hurting a lot recently. Yes, <laughs> it seems so. And we also have Meg Sanders at the end, which we want to thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, Meg Sanders is the owner of Gaia. She's also on the Amendment 64 task force. She is our medical marijuana industry representative for this task force. So she plays a very important role as she will be the person basically educating a lot of these leaders along with um, a lot of these other people that are on the, the task forces and the subcommittees as well. So I want to thank you guys all for being here tonight. So, well, let's get start, started on some of this. Um, I was wondering maybe if, Meg, you could give us an update on kind of what you're experiencing before we start with the task force and, and what you're seeing of people understanding the industry. Is it kind of new? Um, what kind of opposition and what kind of um, openness are you receiving um, from the, the task force? Um, that, thank you so much. Um, I would say overall, everyone on the task force is very interested in learning about the industry. Um, we have given many opportunities and many invites to people who haven't been to a grow or dispensary to make sure that they understand exactly what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, what that looks like, what it feels like, um, so they have a better understanding as far as what they're trying to piece together. Um, overall, I can't say there's been a ton of pushback. I, I would say that for the most part, uh, bringing specific topics about the industry or how it works or the nuances of it, um, I would say for the most part I've received very open, um, understanding, thoughtful reception of that data. So that, I think that's good. Seems like that's how we're, we're getting everything all around. I mean, even the Department of Transportation is excited to create the first system here and really open to what we're saying. So we're all in a really good spot, it seems like. I would agree with that. I think the other thing that's been wonderful is I've had a, a lot of business owners, patients, um, people that are very passionate about the industry reach out to me, and I, I highly encourage that. Um, I'm a small business owner. You know, I understand where you're coming from, and I'm really interested in getting your feedback and your concerns. And I encourage you to, to continue to reach out to me. I'm happy to, to um, represent you the best that I'm uh, the best that I'm able in any you know whether it's in the work group or in the actual task force. Hey Meg, when these folks go to some of the committee meetings and have the opportunity to speak, what are the, some of the things that you think they should be emphasizing to the the audience? Well, I mean, I think that there's a lot of ways that we can work together on this. And, you know, at the end of the day, we, we have a wish list this long and we have a time frame this long. So we have to really prioritize. And there's a lot of opportunities to message here. And, and I can help you one-on-one -on -one as far as some of the things that, that are very important and very critical as far as what we're hearing in the actual work group pieces. So again, if you're interested in coming to public speaking with a, with a specific work group, I would love to, to speak with you beforehand. Um, hands down, I think 
We just want to remain safe from, obviously, the, the biggest elephant in the room, which is the federal government. And, um, and, and I think that's an important piece of this. And I also think that, that we have 400 licensees out here that um, the industry needs to make sure the people that are, are, are working on these amendment, on the Amendment 64 and working on the rules, um, that we honor and respect the pioneers of this business. And that, that's my, one of my biggest concerns representing the industry, is that we are doing a responsible job as far as creating or suggesting regulation that honors all of the hard work that we've all done. That's probably one of my largest concerns. That's awesome. And it has been a lot of hard work. You haven't yeah. worked hard, then. <laughs> who hasn't slept Lucky in their you. Who hasn't slept in their grill? Come on, raise your hand. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, Chloe, if you don't mind, I, let, let me do like a one-minute sort of overall picture of what the task force is, the working groups, and maybe some of the agenda items. Uh, just to give you guys kind of a big picture here, and then we can jump into more of the specifics. But So, you know, the governor set up the Amendment 64 task force. He appointed 24 members to it, um, and you know, this was in the December time frame. So now there's five working groups that are all doing, you know, the bulk of the work, and those working groups are going to make recommendations to the task force, and then that task force, there's, uh, there's four state legislators on that task force, and the idea is they're going to take a bill to the state legislature with all those recommendations and they'll introduce it probably uh, the beginning of March and they'll have until uh, I think it's May 10th or so when the session is over to actually pass it. Um, I, I don't see any reason why something isn't going to pass so I think the big issue is what is going to be in that bill and is it going to be good, is it going to be bad, is it going to switch things up a lot or not. So there's five working groups uh, the regulatory working group, uh, which is really concerned with how the business model is going to be regulated. We've got the consumer safety working group, uh, which labeling, packaging, and a number of other issues. Uh, we've got the worker bymon, which is tax funding um, and civil law, which we, we just did banking. And uh, I'll do some more about that here in a, when, when the time's right. Uh, and then we did employer-employee rights issues. Uh, next week, we'll be dealing with the excise tax uh, piece of it. Uh, and then the other two working groups, we got criminal law, which is really focused on changing, um, or not changing, but really making all the state criminal laws in line with Amendment 64. And then the final working group is on local authority and control, which is really primarily, you know, dealing with uh, how the cities and counties are, uh, what, what their role is in all of this. So that, that's kind of the big picture for everybody, and uh, now we can argue about the details. Thank you. All right, well, let's get into the questions. You guys ready? All right. What is the best way to address the black market through regulation since so many counties are banning and every home could be a grow? And how might such large black market affect regulated businesses? So I, I think one thing that's important to remember with the black market is that when you create a vacuum, it's going to be filled. So those jurisdictions are looking at this as an out of control legalization marijuana effort, they're going to be banning marijuana in the jurisdictions. It's going to allow all the marijuana to be grown by uh, all, adults 21 years and older. And that's where the diversion is going to come from with no uh, oversight control or enforcement from state or local authorities. Um, I think when you start seeing the, the local authorities taking a responsible approach and not trying to uh, prohibit this by regulation, but by actually encouraging uh, businesses to come in, encouraging legislation that's going to help small businesses grow. Uh, you're going to see the marijuana flowing through controlled organizations uh, and entities, and it's going to keep it out of the hands of children. Can I chime in briefly on that? Sure. Th there is no black market after Amendment 64. <laughs> there, there just isn't. <laughs> Amendment 64 legalizes marijuana. And it says, and Amendment 64, its drafters, and I'm one of them, we sold this campaign as the Alcohol Marijuana Equalization Initiative. That's how it was sold to the voters. That's how the opponents and the proponents debated it. Treat it like alcohol. Does anybody talk about a black market in alcohol? Have you heard that lately? Well, you've Probably. seen that show Moonshiners. I mean, that it's high. It well, exists. The, the, 
those guys aren't violating the law, yeah. and they're not in Colorado anyway, but they're not violating the law. Marijuana is legal. Any adult can possess it, just like alcohol. So they're really, they're, I think we in our movement should be mindful of our terminology. There's no more black market. And um, it, it, there isn't a black market in alcohol, and there isn't one in marijuana. And the beauty of Amendment 64 is it gives this massive right to individuals completely untaxed, completely unregulated, and completely unfettered by any government intrusion to get together with as many adults as possible. And that, that's not me talking, that's Sergeant Jim Gearhart from the uh, North Metro Drug Task Force literally being quoted in the Denver Post as saying, there is no limit to the amount of adults who can get together and grow their six plants. So, this is their opinion. So that means that it truly is legal. And just like beer, you can brew it in your own home. The government's not going to mess with you on that. And I know this is a radical thought. This is a radical notion to even people who say they are marijuana supporters because they built their lives and careers on marijuana being illegal. And, and that, that is a challenge for our own community, and that's difficult. But the sooner we realize marijuana is legal and there's nothing wrong with it, and don't buy into the opponent's view that marijuana is somehow evil or dangerous because it, it simply isn't. I mean, it, I think it is less dangerous than what you can buy right over there on the other side of that And I think we're starting to see that, too. I mean, with the Department of Transportation, I mean, they realize it's not dangerous. It's just more of a, you know, something that we have to figure out as far as our regulations. So what are the pros and cons of regulating marijuana like alcohol, which is a tiered system, versus like MMJ, which is a forced vertical system? Because that is what, you know, we have like different things. I mean, as we go through this, it seems like we're going to, you know, split that system right with Amendment 64. So what are we looking at as far as well, this how is, we think we're going to go about that? Th this is an opportunity to look out there and pull what's best from every single system. Um, the medical marijuana system, I think, was necessary at the time, and I think it's done a great job, and it's been a, a very upstanding um, reflection on the industry that has done so well. Uh, but I think we can all agree that there are problems with that system. There's problems with the liquor model system, and there's problems with the tobacco system. So in one sense, we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel and coming up with a fourth system that's completely different than everything else, but we can look at those other systems and say, oh, that works and that works, but that doesn't work, and we, hopefully we can cobble together a system that looks good and works well, and not only can be implemented effectively, but can be enforced effectively. At the same time, it encourages free market, um, it encourages entrepreneurs, encourages small business, encourages uh, employees, it encourages feeling commercial space, it encourages build outs, all these things that will contribute towards a growing economy. Hopefully, we can put together a model that, that just takes the best of all of this. Because my guess oh, we, is, like Kristen pointed out last time we were here, that we want to avoid the liquor model where for licensing you can only have one. Mm -hmm. my, I'm pretty sure folks here wouldn't want to just be only retail. Um, because that's the way it is in the booze world. And, and even though it says regulate like alcohol, we probably don't want to adopt that part of the alcohol system. Right. Yeah, I think uh, one, of, one of the big issues that we're dealing with too is that this, there's a very, very short time frame. And uh, a lot of people who quite frankly, uh, you know, they might be cops, they might be DAs, they might be other people who have been involved, but they don't know an awful lot about the medical marijuana framework that we've all been uh, living in and, 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 and all the compliance issues that have gone in and the amount of money that's been invested not only by the businesses but also by uh, the state, you know, the regulatory agency. Um, and so I, I think, you know, uh, to, to kind of further that whole point about not reinventing the wheel, if we start reinventing the wheel and we've got such a short time period and a lot of people who maybe don't actually have our best interests in mind, uh, that can start becoming a very, very scary prospect uh, quickly. But we should give freedom a chance. <laughs> yes. and, we, and, and we do have the opportunity to reinvent the wheel. Marijuana is a unique substance. There's nothing like it in the world. There's nothing like it that has no lethal dose, literally. Think about that. It's, it's a miracle plant that the Lord placed on our earth. I mean, maybe I'm getting a little philosophical here, but, and we do have the opportunity to chart a new course. 
So and what did we these should folks do to get that done, Rob? Because, I mean, we, we have, what, two months to, do, to create a hell of a lot of roles, if that? And I'm Less worried that. that it's going so fast and there isn't enough time to really do this that this is going to get that, that is a good more question. screwed up. And, and so. the, answer is, the answer is this. I mean, first of all, Amendment 64 does not empower the legislature to regulate marijuana. It, it just simply doesn't. It says the legislature can pass an excise tax and the legislature has the ability to regulate hemp, period. It specifically places the regulatory authority within the Department of Revenue. That's a specific grant of constitutional authority. That's what the voters voted for. That's how we designed it. That's how we wanted it. We actually, strangely enough, trust the MMED more than we trust the elected politicians. I'm sorry, not meaning to offend elected politicians. There are many good ones out there, but the voters specifically trust Department of Revenue more than the elected politicians. So if what the legislature produces is something not to our liking and not to the voters' liking, we do have the option of going to court, telling a judge Amendment 64 doesn't allow the legislature to do this. So keep in mind also this Amendment 64 task force, and there are good people on that task force. There is no doubt there are some good people on there, and these people up here who are here are the good people on the task force. But this is a hand-picked committee by a governor who opposed Amendment 64. He picked every single member of the task force. The governor did. And this is a governor who said he was against Amendment 64. So well, we have some opposition over mind. here saying that you guys are get, receiving a pretty good outcome on it, though, correct? It's, it, so, we'll, I mean, we'll wait and see. And luckily, though, if the outcome is not to our liking, then we have the backstop of saying, sorry, legislature, you never had the authority to do this in the first place. You just wasted your time because Amendment 64 specifically says the regulations are to be passed by the Department of Revenue. That's in there. That's black and white. I, I didn't make that part up. That's just in there. So if, if we like what the legislature does, that's great. But if we don't like it, we're, we're not without options. Right. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, if only marijuana cultivation facilities are allowed to produce marijuana under a tiered system. Like liquor, what happens to MMCs and MIPS who convert to the recreational model who had been used for cultivating their own marijuana? These are just some questions for you guys to kind of think about. Could be possibilities since it's coming so fast. Uh, that's definitely something that has to be taken into account. and, and uh, so far, it's been very broad level discussions, and only now we're starting to really debate the issues and to come figure out what the outcomes are going to be. And, and at, at this point, I, I don't think we have any outcomes. Um, it seems like more people are talking more towards a liquor license model than an MMED model, but no decisions have been made. Um, certainly, I hope whatever we come up with on the Amendment 64 task force, uh, that we're very cognizant of the investment that medical marijuana businesses have made and that we don't necessarily just put a system in there that's going to wipe your industry out in, in a matter of days. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping, I mean, I, I really don't know what the, what, what's going to happen, but it would be nice, like uh, Rob was saying, for free market and capitalism to rule here. Um, you know, people who grow like to grow, people who sell like to sell. And, uh, I, I think it's been limiting the medical marijuana model to have this vertical integration. I'm, I know I'm hoping that it, it doesn't become vertically integrated, but at this point, we're, all t we're taking all the information into account. Uh, we're looking at all of it, trying to figure out what's best. What is the current time frame that we see being discussed for this implementation of Amendment 64 business since we've already seen the MMJ, MMJ registry numbers are already dropping? Well, some of the time frames are, and, and uh, the panel can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the legislature needs to pass uh, some statutes by July 1st. And uh, given the nature of um, the way statutes are passed, I believe the first reading needs to be three months before, so April 1st. So the task force job is to come up with recommendations by the end of February. We're going to submit those to the legislature. So the legislature will have March. 30 days to look at our suggestions and somehow turn that into drafted language. Um, after July 1st, I guess the, um, the Department of Revenue needs to start taking applications by October 1st. And then the um, 
I guess the first licenses need to be issued by January 1st, is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yep. Okay. Do you think those convicted of drug felonies will be allowed to be licensed? Um, this is huge. They haven't been already. Um, since basically, in the, it's, it's the case with gaming and alcohol, given enough time passed, like 10 years, do you think that um, that will come back, the original MMJ ordinance, for that 10 years out before they can be back in the business or no? It hasn't been brought up specifically, but I think that there is, again, the elephant in the room. Once the federal government is not um, doing what they do, <laughs> I think it becomes a different discussion. And I think right now it's, it's a tough discussion. You know, I mean, we, we have a... We have a oversight as far as federal government intervention, and, and no one wants that, and no one wants that at all. Um, but I also think that there is an interesting aspect of this as far as looking at liquor and looking at gaming, and a, and a really clear path that we could follow once that piece goes away. Um, I would also just add that in, in advocacy for patients out there, we want to make sure that you have access to, to medicine um, that, that you've come to rely on. And one opportunity for you to participate, in, as business owners as well, is to go to um, the consumer safety work group and, and make sure that we're talking about some type of transition here um, with cards. Maybe, maybe even though they say they're expiring here, maybe we can do an extension. Maybe there's, there's um, a free renewal, something like that, to make sure that patients have access to medicine until this is implemented. That's a huge concern of mine. How will current MMJ businesses transfer their plant counts when they legally belong to patients if they choose to convert to a recreational model? If you cut down all the plants, you cut down all your money. So that's kind of an issue that we probably should address, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially what if the county, I mean, we know that 91 counties banned medical marijuana. So what if the county bans recreational marijuana, or what if my MMCs in Denver, my OPCs in Boulder, and Boulder decides to ban them, but Denver allows medical, how does that work? It doesn't. Yeah, this, this transition is going to be fascinating. I mean, the good news for MMCs is obviously you have an explicit preference in Amendment 64. We designed it that way. We wanted your votes. Thank you very much. We won. And now you have a... a major advantage over anyone else who wants to get into recreational marijuana. I think you know that. Uh, the mechanics of the transition will be worked out, I'm assuming, by Department of Revenue and the new agency. I assume it's going to be called the Marijuana Enforcement Division. They'll just take the medical out of there. A lot of the same people will go over. Um, th this obsession with destruction of plants and you know, you're over and so destroy these innocent plants that didn't hurt anybody. I mean, it's just, we, we've got to get past that. I mean, that, that is just, it's just stupid. It's, it's just stupid. Will any of the licenses under A64 other than the cultivation facility license be allowed to cultivate marijuana? For example, if I'm a retail marijuana store, could I cultivate limited amounts of marijuana but still purchase from a supplier like a brew pub license under a liquor code? Do you That's, mean on the same premises? Or it doesn't matter general? the premises. Say I own a liquor store. Do I have to, you know, can I still grow my own to supply my liquor store plus buy from suppliers? Am I going to be required to not be able to own both licenses? Because we kind of have a vertically integrated system. So when we pull our medical licenses and turn them recreational, I mean, some people, yeah, thank God we don't have to do both anymore, but some people may have both of those facilities. Do we sell one for a couple hundred grand and turn the other license? Are we allowed to have both? Have you thought about that? I mean, that raises an interesting concept of the brew pub, the brew pub, where you have all the equipment right there and you're drinking right here. I can picture it grows behind clear glass as you're buying from a bar next door. Uh, I, I, I can't say that's been discussed on the task force, but it certainly raises a pretty picture. Uh, I, I, like, like I was saying before, I think these are all great ideas. Uh, the task force is a government entity, and as all government entities, it's, it's moving very, very slowly. Uh, but these are, these are definitely interesting ideas that should be explored. But... You know, Warren, <laughs> on one of our panels one time, we were discussing the THC DUI, and you said your concern 
was finding those limits. And even for employers, this is, this is important because say we, we put like a five nanogram, that's when it's gonna start affecting people with their employment. Say you're a parent, you get two five nanogram THC DUIs, they think you're always you know, impaired as, as a parent. So, I mean, if we don't start getting these issues and addressing them, these employment, I mean, these conversations with people to, well, yeah, yeah, you can say that somebody can't, you know, you don't have to hire somebody if they, if they're, if they medicate or if they're even a patient, but, um, you know, where are those rights come in and how do we change that? I mean, we, what, do we just have to start suing? Rob is going to say yes. I know you guys. Uh... I, I, honestly, I'm just fascinated with the issue and I'll admit I'm completely ignorant on it. I was wondering if anyone on the panel can discuss the constitutionality of saying that if you have marijuana in your system, even if you're not impaired, that that's grounds for employment. Is the zero tolerance policy constitutional? Right, so the zero uh, tolerance well, policy, even for the five nanograms, right? It was made for a zero tolerance. All it says is that employers don't have to tolerate use on the job, but it doesn't say anything about employers reaching into your private life, and there's a Colorado statute that directly says if, if you're doing something legal on your own time, and this was the smoker's rights law, ironically enough, it says an employer can't fire you for that. And this came about when there was a trend for employers to fire cigarette smokers because they, they're less healthy than the rest of us and they cost more and they, you know, health care costs and all that. So the legislature responded and said, you can't fire someone for legal conduct off the job. And this is now legal conduct off the job, marijuana. Then you get into the federal still issue. Have consequences. Well, we're an at-will state, though, right? So they can say, "Well, I don't like you, so you're fired." <laughs> they they have that. <laughs> they have that power to some extent, but usually employers aren't that smart, and they'll say, "We're firing you because of marijuana." <laughs> and if they're dumb enough to say that in writing, you've got a case. And, and you can prove that's why they fired you. I mean, it's not always, always possible, but sometimes you can prove these cases. If, if otherwise you're a good employee and no write-ups, no problems, nothing, and then all of a sudden it comes to light that you, you take a UA and then you're fired the next day. I mean, so there, there is a way to prove these things. And I, I don't think people should surrender on the employee employer thing, but I, I do agree with Warren. I mean, at will state that that is powerful for the employer. There's no doubt about that. So we just need to overcome that, be smarter than they are, and show the evidence. Before we wrap up tonight, too, we should talk about potency limits. Go for it. So uh, there has been somewhat of a push from the opponents of Amendment 64. Well. Let me, let, me, let me take a step back here and say, I, I think that uh, because the opponents, they won the head, they, sorry, they lost the head-to-head -head battle, I think we can start anticipating a bunch of attacks from the side. And uh, the DUID battle is certainly one of them. Um, I think the potency battle is one of them too. Because you can imagine uh, if, uh, if there was a 1% potency limit, does Amendment 64 mean anything anymore? Uh, not really. <laughs> So now the proposals, the numbers I've been hearing are somewhere in the neighborhood of 15%. Now, now the question is, is where on earth did that number come from? And I don't really know. But uh, Mike, it came from New Jersey. New Jersey. New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, they have that number. So that's, is that the limit for the medical marijuana program? Yes, it is. Well, when the alcohol industry is willing to agree to that limit, then maybe we will too. I, uh, so that basically right, means that exactly, we would have to grow 15% exactly. potency marijuana. Uh, that, that is the proposal, yes. Uh, can I say proposal? That, that language might be strong. It's being, you know, let's, I want to be clear so we don't have a crazy, like, you know, it, it's, been, it's been tossed about. And we just want to make sure that, again, we're educating, we're presenting logical arguments, we're offering alternatives. Um, and just really, if we're regulating like alcohol, let's just look at Everclear. It's very, very simple. Along those lines, kind of what I mean, I've been saying how slow this process has been, and the first couple of meetings have always been no idea is a bad idea, just get it all on the table, throw, throw all the spaghetti at the wall, see what sticks. It's only now that we're starting to actually get into the meat and potatoes of what's mm -hmm. going on and debating things. And uh, I'm in the social issues and safety group, and potency has been brought up. Several other ideas have been brought up. And 
I'm going to reserve my opinion on that, those ideas until we actually bring those up in the work group on a debate level, and then it's going to be very clear what people's positions are going to be. And, and keep in mind, alcohol kind of does have potency levels because you need a different license to produce beer versus malt liquor ver versus spirits versus wine. So it kind of scares me when we bring up when alcohol does it because they did. Well, I think it's good that we all educate each other and that we work with our task force members. And, you know, the more respectful we are with our governor who already opposes it, I mean, remember, too, whatever we're saying, you know, there's also a bunch of people that are watching us and people who voted for it who don't quite understand it. So sometimes the way we say that and how we do it will be, um, you know, who we touch, too, in our market. So we want to be careful about that as well. Yes. Great. All right. Anybody else have anything else? Thanks for coming tonight, and uh, you can see the video on your MMJinfo.com. See you next month on February 21st for a tax symposium. And thank you to the panel. There's a lot of lot of good brain trust. Yes, thank you so much to the panel. Thanks.